For the latest information regarding the COVID-19 pandemic in Cupertino, please visit cupertino.org slash coronavirus. Obviously, you'll be hearing from him uh, shortly, so thank you very much, Governor. We have Assemblyman Jim Cooper, uh, who is a uh, well-known in these parts, and we appreciate all of his support. Uh, same thing we can say for uh, Dr. Richard Pan, a local senator. And we have a couple of folks we don't, inter uh, don't get to interact with um, as often, but we're glad to have them as well. The Assembly Speaker, Anthony Rendon, and Senator Pro Tem, Tony Atkins. So again, very, very excited to have everybody here today, and the governor is gonna share some exciting news uh, about an announcement. The work is moving forward with bringing our kids back to school. In Elk Grove Unified, we are very excited to have a plan in place that will be bringing our kids back uh, coming in uh, March, and we're doing the work, and we're set and ready to do that, so we appreciate that work very much. I do wanna note, there's been a huge disruption um, in all of our lives, and you know there's been a huge disruption um, within our schools. But I will say, we've learned a great deal. We will not be the same Elk Grove Unified when we open in March and moving forward as we were in January. We're gonna be better. We've learned a great deal. The other piece I wanna make sure I'm clear about is we're moving forward because of the relationships we have with our labor partners. We have seven union, unions slash employee organizations that work with us on a regular basis and their cooperation, their leadership, along with our board of trustees and my cabinet who's worked tirelessly since, uh, since March are all the reasons that we're able to move forward. We're here about equity, we're about serving all kids and we're gonna do everything we can moving forward uh, to, uh, to make sure that happens. So again, excited to have you here with us at uh, Franklin Elementary School um, in Elk Grove Unified, and I'm very happy to introduce Assemblyman Cooper. Thank you, Superintendent Hoffman. Good morning, I'm Assemblyman Jim Cooper. I represent the Ninth Assembly District, and I call Elk Grove home. I wanna thank Governor Newsom, uh, Pro Tem Apkins, and Speaker Rendon and their staffs for their tireless work that led up to today's announcement. As we approach the one-year mark of the start of the lockdown, today's news could not come at a better time. Kids, parents, teachers have patiently waited for the cases to drop and agreements to be made on the safe reopening of our schools. SB 86 and AB 86 will get the ball rolling on getting our kids back in the classroom. I look forward to voting on this bill this coming Thursday. Counties are beginning to see their case race drops and are moving into less restrictive tiers. Just a couple of weeks ago, the legislature and the governor worked on a plan to get kids back to playing youth sports, and now we have a plan and an actual concrete reopening plan. As we know, California is a large and diverse state. AB 86 and SB 86 provide important local control and will allow school districts to develop their own plans designed to meet their unique needs and will incentivize them to reopen sooner rather than later. The proposal will also include much needed additional funding for all our schools to help them address lost learning time and learning challenges caused by distance learning. I'm especially supportive of this funding, our students deserve all the resources we can provide them, providing additional academic support, reducing class size and summer school where necessary and help our students regain much of what they have lost during this pandemic. All in all, Parents can now take a sigh of relief in knowing that the legislature and the governor are working to get kids back in the classroom in a safe and healthy way for both children and teachers. Next up is Senator Dr. Richard Pan. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Senator Cooper. And uh, I also want to, first of all, thank uh, the uh, Elk Grove School District, uh, the uh, teachers and staff who work here, the leadership for hosting this event. I know that uh, it, was, it wasn't quite a year ago when um, this school district uh, had to take steps to protect the students and the people who work here to uh, initially close the school district, but then brought it back um, to, uh, for distance learning, and some, certainly something that uh, 
we've continued to, people have continued to work on to be sure that kids are able to learn. So uh, we're not really talking about reopening as much as we're talking about trying to get back to in-person learning. Uh, so again, I represent uh, this area, but I'm also a pediatrician. And I know as a pediatrician that uh, students and, uh, have been suffering. Uh, distance learning has been a huge challenge. In addition to the challenges of being able to uh, whether you have Wi-Fi connection or you know your parents may be essential workers and other types of challenges, and then of course for the teachers to have to try to change the modality they're teaching. We also know that uh, students, uh, children uh, have been suffering with uh, uh, anxiety and depression and other types of things related to being isolated and uh, and the challenges of uh, the pandemic. And so it was very important that uh, we work together to try to. Uh, bring back in-person learning in a safe manner because we also need to understand that our teachers and staff who are involved in both the teaching and care of students also have families. They themselves may be at risk. They may have members of their families at risk as well. And certainly I know that uh, hearing from uh, them and from parents that uh, they want to be sure kids get educated. And that's why this, what we're uh, doing here today and what we're announcing here today is so very important. It's so very important that we try to make up for the delays that have happened because of this pandemic, despite the best efforts of our educators to try to keep our students on track, uh, despite the best efforts of parents, of pediatricians, of mental health workers, others to try to get our students to, to a place where uh, they can uh, continue to move forward, that, that we can address their mental, the mental health issues that have arisen and other types of challenges that have arisen as well. And so, I, first of all, I want to uh, thank the governor. I know that uh, his office had reached out to my office way back in even November and talked about what could we do to try to help our students to get them back. And, you know, at that point, the cases were still rising, right? They were rising through the holidays and so forth, but that work was ongoing. And certainly, I want to also thank my colleagues uh, in, my, in the State Senate as well as the State Assembly. And it's, it's been a you know, challenging discussion. And the challenge isn't because people don't want to try to do the right thing. Everyone's trying to do the right thing. They want to help the students. They want to be sure we keep things safe. But it's certainly been a challenging pandemic, you know, trying to deal with incomplete information, trying to figure out what kind of resources we could bring to bear. And so I really want to express my appreciation and the leadership of um, the governor and uh, my colleagues, uh, the pro tem and uh, the speaker, and bring together various stakeholders and say, look, Let's figure out what we can try to do to address all these particular challenges and come up with an agreement that we can get resources to school districts, school districts like Elk Grove, like other school districts throughout the country, uh, across our state, who need help to be able to try to get back to in-person learning, right? Who need, who need more resources, who have to do mitigation, right? We got cohorting, we got testing, we got lots of other things we need to do to keep people safe, but require more resources and help so we can do this. So again, I'm really thrilled to be able to be here uh, to say that uh, we, are, we have a plan, we are getting those resources to school districts, and we're gonna make this happen. So with that, I uh, now want to invite uh, Champion for Education, my good friend, uh, Speaker Anthony Rendon. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Pan, good morning. It's important that we do not think about schools as just a part of California's budget, although education is that. We cannot merely think of school seats as a safe daytime place for our children, though surely they should be that. We must not reduce education to a prerequisite for earning a living, although it can be that too. When schooling is done right, it does so much more. It opens worlds and challenges hearts. When education is wrong, it is we who have failed the children. It is not the children failing school. I know because I was once a student who barely made it through. The schools did not have what I needed, and that's why I care. Today's press event is about more than turning keys and reopening classrooms, and it is more than just a return to schools that are safe. Our plan is also geared toward providing schools the resources and the incentives that they need uh, and to ensure that education can be all things for every child in California. We are here at this school today because the governor and the pro tem have worked with all of us together on this. Together we were all determined not to fail California's children. 
The shared commitment to children of Gavin Newsom and Tony Atkins allowed us to get to this point. Governor Newsom came out early with a thoughtful approach to quick and safe reopening. Pro Tem Atkins and the Senate teamed with the Assembly to develop a strong legislative plan that took the governor's leadership as a signpost. In the end, we all reached agreement on this plan. The policy know-how of three of our key assembly chairs was also necessary to make this plan work. We all owe thanks to assembly members Phil Ting, Kevin McCarty, and Patrick O'Donnell. And of course, we owe thanks to every teacher, every staff member, every parent, and every st student who had to bear with the disadvantages of learning in a pandemic world. We appreciate, appreciate your tenacity and your creativity. It is what gives us hope for the future and a belief that we must keep working to fulfill the promise of education in California. It's my honor to introduce my legislative partner, Senate Pro Tem, Tony Atkins. Well, thank you, Speaker Rendon. It is uh, good to be with you again. Uh, we haven't spent so much time together since we served together in the assembly. And uh, it is good to be here with all of you. Super, uh, Superintendent, congratulations. Uh, this is a model, absolutely. Uh, an incredible school district. Your partners obviously worked very hard to, to be where you are today. And this is a beautiful school. I'm, I'm thrilled to be at Franklin with my colleagues. You know, I, uh, I have to say, uh, we all, you've heard it before already. So as the fourth or fifth speaker, what left is there to say? except we have all been working diligently to get to this moment. Uh, if, as if weeks weren't enough of conversations, uh, the weekends have been filled with yet again thinking we're close, getting there, uh, making sure uh, that we do it right, that we uh, cross those T's and dot those I's. And, uh, you know, that sounds like a phrase, but what that means is exactly what my colleagues have already expressed. How do we respond to uh, administrators and managers in the schools? How do we respond to support staff that serve the meals and provide the support services, the custodians? How do we respond to parents who want their kids in school? And yet when you look at the data and you see that some of the schools, uh, the kids have not returned and that's because the parents are concerned. Uh, they want their kids in school, but they're also concerned about kids' safety. The teachers want to be back teaching. Some of them, many of them are over the age of 65. Some of them, as the speaker said, and my colleagues are taking care of vulnerable family members, teaching their own kids. So it's important that we get it right. When we talk about crossing T's and dotting I's, that has real implications for real people on the ground every single day. So that made this very difficult. You cannot reduce any of this to a couple of sound bites. There is absolutely no way. And much like Mr. Speaker, you know, I was one of those kids. I was one of those kids. I was a latchkey kid. My twin sister and I had to get to school every morning on our own, age seven, a couple blocks away. But, you know, it's a long way when you got short legs. You know, we had to get to school. We went to the breakfast club in the morning so we could have a meal that somebody provided to us. I'll never forget the cinnamon donuts. They were my favorite. Schools are an important part of our psychological, our academic, our mental life. I told the governor as I came in, I don't think I can reach that basket. I spent many years playing basketball in middle school, high school, and college. Sports, important component of what we're doing. We have to get it right. And we are rowing in the same direction. Finally, I think we are at the dock, together, unified. And like my uh, colleague, my legislative colleague, Mr. Speaker, I wanna thank some folks as well. Every weekend, every weekend, the budget chair in the Senate, Nancy Skinner. The sub one chair for education, Senator Laird. Obviously the policy chair, Ms. Leva. We worked diligently with the counterparts that Mr. Speaker mentioned in the assembly to make sure that we took the proposal that the governor brought to us and we put our imprint on it because we every single day are talking to all of those people I mentioned earlier the school districts, the superintendents, the managers, the teachers, the parents, the support staff, and the kids. I watched the governor grill one of the little, little ones outside on what she was learning. 
You know, and then there's the learning loss. You know, this is $6.6 .6 billion. And we'll give you all the details, how it breaks down, where it goes, when it goes, what the incentives are, what the bottom line formulas are related to the local control funding formula. We can answer all of those questions because we've taken the time to get it right, we hope. And yet we gotta be prepared for the next pivot or the next thing that comes our way. We have to be prepared for that so that we respond to the people that we are responsible for, that we are all responsible for, and we will because we are not done. We cannot make up the time, not really, not physically. We cannot turn the clock back and make up the time that our kids, our young people have lost. So we're going to have to make up for that in a different way. And that's part of what some of this funding can do. We need to heal and we need to heal together. And we need to do it understanding that our work is far from done. But this today is a good place to be, a good place to be. And with that, I want to turn it over to another one of our incredibly dedicated leaders, someone who's been living this every single day for a year, and that's our great governor, Gavin Newsom. Thank you, Madam Pro Tem and, and uh, Mr. Speaker and Senator and Assembly Member. I'll brag on in a moment, but I want to just begin appropriately by uh, thanking the superintendent, Superintendent Hoffman, and uh, all the bargaining units that are here and the spirit to which the superintendent uh, invited us, the spirit to which uh, brings us back uh, to uh, a school district that in many respects reflects the bookmark that has been uh, this pandemic and the last year. This was one of the largest school districts uh, to announce closure uh, close to a year ago, and now it's one of the largest school districts to announce its reopening uh, less than a year later. And it's demonstrably because of the superintendent's leadership, uh, the incredible support of the school board, uh, the paraprofessionals, the classified employees, the, uh, well, all of the bargaining units uh, that work together across differences, small issues, large issues, committed to a process, committed to one another to build trust, build capacity, and ultimately get uh, to where we are today. This is one of 35 uh, counties in the state that has already been providing vaccinations as a priority to their educators. Uh, that is also encouraging and as a concept, a construct rather, uh, they are already well on their way to providing most of the educators uh, in this district, at least that first dose. Today marks more broadly a commitment for the state of California across the spectrum in all 58 ca ca uh, counties to provide at least 10%, a minimum of 75,000 doses we are setting aside for our educators, for our school employees broadly, uh, all up and down the state of California. On Thursday and Friday, we'll actually be utilizing the two large FEMA sites, Thursday and Friday in Southern California and in Northern California, as educator days exclusively to provide even additional vaccinations. Those don't come out of the 75,000 allocations. Those will be additive. It's just a commitment, our resolve, to prioritize our educators as we're prioritizing our most vulnerable, our seniors and those in congregate care facilities, skilled nursing facilities, and the like. 9.1 million now vaccinations have been administered in the state of California. Positivity rate, that should make everyone feel a little bit more positive about where we are and where we're going, down to 2.3% today. And that's based upon a pretty healthy 243,000 tests that were conducted as part of the reporting period. 3,500 cases. Just remember, six weeks ago, we were announcing over 50,000 cases of COVID, 3,500 cases just yesterday. Hospitalizations and ICUs coincidentally down both over a 14-day period, 42.1%. So things are moving in the right direction. Things seem to be stabilizing. We're seeing vaccinations increase. We're seeing the positivity in case rates decrease, though we are seeing a little bit of a plateau, and one needs to be mindful of that as we begin this transition to in-person instruction, as we begin the transition to safely reopening our economy uh, with the appropriate modifications. But you can't reopen your economy unless you get your schools reopened for in-person instruction. You can't meet the cause that should unite every one of us, the issue of equity, and that's not just on the basis of race or ethnicity, it's also gender equity. 
unless you commit to getting our schools safely reopened in person. Single mothers in particular that are celebrating, I imagine, this day compared to many other previous days. So many of our kids and caregivers uh, are celebrating this day because we all are united around coming back safely into the schools and helping with the social emotional supports that our kids so desperately need. As the pro tem said, this is a $6.6 .6 billion commitment, $2 billion specifically for grants to help with in-person instruction. Those are grants that can provide more PPE, though we have set aside three months of free PPE for ventilation, for spacing, for issues related to health and safety. 4.6 billion of the 6.6 .6 to deal with reimagining the school year, giving districts flexibility, looking at school days, looking at intervention, deeper intervention to address kids' wellness, to address their needs as it relates to community learning hubs, address learning loss as the districts see fit, including potentially extending the school year and moving the school year into the summer. 4.6 billion of that 6.6 .6 provides for that flexibility. We incentivize opening up our schools by providing real resources to do it. We expect that all of our TK to two classrooms open within the next month. We want to see more happen beyond that for unified going into red tiers. It's TK to six and it's a commitment to one grade in middle and high school. And our core belief is this. Once you dip your toe in, once you build a cohort confidently, once you build trust, then we will start to see a cadence of reopening across the spectrum. But again, on the basis of building confidence and trust, not only for the caregivers, not only for our educators, uh, but for parents as well that may be hesitant to bring their kids back in school as well. So we start with cohorts of those of greatest need, of greatest risk. And by the way, it's not just TK to two, it includes our homeless, it includes our foster kids, it includes kids without devices, without the internet. It includes kids that are English as second language learners. It includes the needs, most special needs, including IDD and physical disabilities. That's the commitment, that's our priority. We wanna see this happen all across the state of California and that's what this package provides. So I couldn't be more pleased and proud of the spirit that brings us here as well. Not only the spirit of the superintendent uh, and this district, but also the spirit of leadership. You know, the pro tem made a comment uh, that I smiled under my mask uh, about the speaker, myself, pro tem, spending so much time together, though those two in particular, uh, more than they have in some time. And it's right to just reflect in the last five weeks what they have accomplished as it relates to moratorium on rental evictions as it relates to providing $2 billion of additional grants to our small businesses, to provide billions of dollars to 5.7 million Californians to direct relief checks, $600 checks to support childcare broadly, $400 million as part of that $7.6 billion deal to help support these efforts, including reopening schools. And of course, today, uh, this framework on getting our schools safely reopened. So I, I just, I, I'm proud of their leadership. I'm proud of their incredible collaborative spirit. Uh, the speaker and the pro tem and I uh, have been spending a great deal of time together, not only on these three critical issues, but a series of other issues on sick leave and issues of conformity on PPE, uh, PPP, if I haven't lost you, you're not paying attention, on many other issues. And we wanna take that momentum, that spirit forward, working uh, with the Assembly, working with the Senate, working with Senator Pan, who's been an incredible champion of all of these efforts, Assemblymember Cooper, uh, who's been insistent uh, that we move deliberatively, but thoughtfully as well. And so I'm here in that light and in that spirit uh, of gratitude and respect for their leadership uh, and this moment where we can announce this agreement. And I look forward after that vote on Thursday to quickly signing uh, this and moving forward uh, to uh, celebrating uh, the reopening for in-person instruction of schools all up and down the state of California. And with that, we're here, all of us, to answer any questions.
Governor, I'm Adam Beam with the Associated Press. If things keep going the way they are in California, do you believe by the end of this month that most, if not all, of the counties will be in the red tier? Well, I, I know this, uh, that tomorrow we are likely, and we're getting the final information, to announce a, a seven additional counties moving into the red tier. Uh, this is on top of the 11 that are no longer in the purple tier. So it would represent uh, roughly 17, 18 counties, plus or minus, we'll see what happens tomorrow, that will be out of the purple tier. We'll also preview tomorrow, as we do every Tuesday, the expectation of what will occur a week later where we anticipate even more momentum still. So you're absolutely right to ask that question. Uh, but the good news as it relates to this school deal, we're not waiting to get out of this purple tier in order to get our kids safely back into in-person instruction. And that's what's so meaningful to me, that we're not slowing down, we're now accelerating the pace of reopening. But I'm very encouraged uh, by the stabilization, the case rates, the positivity rate, and indeed, correctly, you're right, we do anticipate uh, a majority of Californians in the next few weeks to be residing in counties that have moved out of the most restrictive purple tier. And I understand the plan itself, does, while it does define what in-person instruction is, it doesn't set you know, a time limit that says you have to meet in person this many hours per day. Why was that not included? Uh, are you concerned that districts might you know, just have students meet you know, just for an hour a day or so and, and, and count that? I'm not. I, I, look, I, I'm not for one reason. Our teachers and our cafeteria workers, our food workers, our bus drivers, our custodians, they want, they want the sights and sounds. They want kids back safely in school. I just think, you know, once, once we break through, it's the old adage, once a mind is stretched, it never goes back to its original form. Once people feel confident we can safely do this, once we prove this out, TK to two, these smaller cohorts, I have all the confidence uh, that it's almost like a flywheel, that you're gonna start seeing much more rapid pace of reopening. I don't think people, no, no one I talk to, at least, and I talk to plenty of people across the spectrum on this issue. People are supportive, people are cautious, people that are just uh, uninterested in moving. Uh, they all share one thing in common, and that's a commitment to do the right thing, but their concern, their fear, their apprehension has gotten in that way, and that's what we hope we're clearing. And so I'm confident people won't be gaming the system like that. Governor Emily Maha with KCRA. We've been collecting some data from districts in our area, and we have found that some teachers are opting not to be vaccinated. Do you believe that educators should be having in-person interactions with students, especially in districts where social distancing may be a challenge? And if teachers opt not to be vaccinated, should parents have the right to know if their student's teacher is not vaccinated? Yeah, I think everybody that wants to be vaccinated should be vaccinated. Uh, we do not think vaccinations are prerequisite to safely reopening our schools. That's not my opinion. That's the opinion of the CDC, Dr. Fauci, the opinion of educators and experts around the globe, including the opinion of President uh, Joe Biden. And it is the opinion collectively of the legislature, at least on the basis of the agreement we're making today, uh, that we can move forward safely in reopening uh, before uh, that two dose has been administered. That said, we're mindful of the imperative importance of building on the success of 35 counties that are already administering uh, vaccinations. And today, again, I'll remind you, today, March 1st, starts the day we're setting aside a minimum of 75,000 doses to those teachers and educators, it's not just teachers, educators, school staff that choose to get the vaccination. Uh, we are hearing in fact, we were just talking to the superintendent about some of the success he was having here, uh, that the vast majority uh, are very eager and supportive of receiving uh, these vaccines. And now, as you know, this week, we'll have a third vaccine, and that's the single-dose J&J vaccine, which will provide yet another alternative, another option for people that choose simply a one-dose regimen versus a two-dose regimen. Uh, hi, Governor. Rachel Bluth from Kaiser Health News here. I have a question for you and for some of the legislative leaders here. Um, this compromise is obviously a very uh, a big compromise between your office and the legislature. A lot of members have been 
feeling a little sidelined this year about the legislature's role in dealing with this pandemic. To my knowledge, this is the first time that the Senate Assembly have had any input on vaccine distribution. Could this signal kind of a change going forward to have more input from your from the legislature and what could that look like when it comes to vaccines? I'm, I'm for more voices and more choice in terms of access and tiering as it relates to prioritization of vaccinations and I'm very grateful that uh, the two leaders are here and have been counseling us, advising us um, and coordinating with us on many of those efforts and certainly codifying some of the prioritizations for teachers in this legislation which you're right is very significant. Thank you for the question. I would just uh, say as someone who represents 40 senators or 39 others and my partner here, 120 total, I, I can speak for him, but we've had many caucus meetings. We have had working groups who have worked in partnership with the governor's staff and office on all of these issues, on vaccines, on distribution. Uh, I mean, we've had more working groups coming out of the Senate specifically. We have a pandemic working group that uh, was chaired by Lena Gonzalez from Long Beach, now by uh, Josh Newman uh, from Orange County. Uh, we've had more caucus uh, meetings because I want my, my colleagues to be as informed as possible. Their communities are the ones with questions and I will just uh, see. So I believe we've had more conversations that I historically remember in the 10 plus years I've been in the legislature. Yeah, I don't have a lot to add other than to echo uh, the pro tense comments. Uh, uh, Assemblymember Jackie Irwin has led a legislative working group on, on vaccines and vaccine distribution. Our health chair, Jim Wood, has been incredibly involved in not only in oversight, but also in conversations in and around uh, the issue of vaccines. Uh, Dr. Joaquina Rambula, uh, who uh, chairs our budget sub one, has similarly been involved. Folks like Jim Cooper um, from the legislature, from the, the assembly, have been involved as well. So we've we've been uh, fully involved and uh, appreciate uh, the governor and the Senate's cooperation on these matters. Thank you. And just to sort of add on to our legislative leaders, I chaired the Senate Health Committee, and I know that I personally have been participating in practically weekly meetings with the governor's staff. I actually was able to join the governor in Cal Expo to talk about vaccines. And well, certainly, and away from the press event, we've had a chance to have those conversations as well. So I would actually say that the governor's office and Governor Newsom has actually worked closely with the legislature. Do we always agree? Not always, but certainly the door has always been open and we've always proactively had many conversations about things like vaccine distribution and other types of issues as well. And certainly as chair of the health committee, thank you. Also, when you think of Dr. Pan, one of the first things you think about is vaccination. So I, uh, not just the chair, uh, profoundly important voice on this subject. So thank you, doctor, for all your work. Governor, question John Myers from the Los Angeles Times. Um, one of the things that seems key to getting more kids on school and operating this from the state is understanding how many cases there have been at schools that are open. Your administration still has a document online from January 14th instructing for that data. We still don't see the data. So what can you tell us about it? What do you know? Because it seems that that's a big question that people want to know how safe these schools have been that are already open. Yeah, so we have been providing that data on an updated basis, but we have now specifically set aside money in this agreement to hold us to account and to enforce the efforts with more transparency. We've incorporated a strike team with DPH uh, that's working very collaboratively uh, with districts currently. Uh, we've codified that in language, providing tens of millions of dollars for enforcement and oversight and data collection. We put a safely reopening schools hub website up as well a few weeks back uh, as a preview of some of the more dynamic efforts that we'll be putting into place to have more timely reporting of information. There is specific language in this agreement as it relates to reporting, 24-hour reporting requirements for any cases. It has correction strategies as it relates to multiple outbreaks and what we can and cannot do. So we are laying that groundwork very, very prescriptively in this legislation. Governor, just to follow up, Governor, I'm on the website right now under transparency, case reporting by schools. It's not there. So you said it's been released. Where is it? 
Well, the, my point of the legislation is to provide much more detailed and timely information. As it relates to November, December, and January, those numbers are put up. We've been working with the legislature in the last 30 days to put together a completely different framework and strategy with different execution requirements, different criteria, and much more robust transparency, including resources to provide that information in a timely manner. So let me thank you for the follow-up so I can lay that distinction as it relates to what's in this legislation versus what we had in the past. Governor Katie Orr with KQED News. Um, I wonder, given that schools uh, with this money will be able to extend their school year possibly, if you're expecting many districts to actually do that, because of course teachers have been teaching this whole time, just not in school, and if you're getting any pushback from unions who say, you know, our teachers need a break. Well, the bottom line is we're providing flexibility. That $4.6 billion in learning loss flexibility provides for more peer-to-peer -peer counseling, more investment in mental health, more counselors, provides more interventions uh, across the spectrum that could extend the school day as well as opportunity to extend the school year. That's going to be determined. We also have provided not only that $4.6 billion in learning loss, but as you know, the federal government has provided us $8.5 billion in CARES Act I and CARES Act II dollars that also are supplementary and supportive in addition to the Prop 98 resources. And that, by the way, does not include the resources that we anticipate coming from what becomes of the $1.9 trillion new stimulus. So we have resources that will allow us more flexibility, more opportunity in the next weeks and months to answer that question uh, in a much more uh, robust way, depending on conditions. But I appreciate the point you made, and I'll just briefly comment on that, that our teachers have been teaching, uh, that we have been committed to our kids, and, and I just want to recognize that. And it's not just our teachers. Uh, we were just talking to a representative from AFSCME and all the classified employees they have. They're, in, they're here at the school site, have been. Uh, some of our psychologists uh, have been. Uh, some even doing uh, knocks on doors and meeting kids in their home. So one does need to acknowledge the hard work that has been done under these very challenging uh, circumstances with distance learning and some in-person learning that has been occurring across the state for many, many months. So the issue of exhaustion, obviously that issue, like so many issues, is a meet confer issue. It's an issue for the memorandums of understanding. It's an issue to work across the bargaining table to figure out, but we have now more resources to help figure that out than we've had in the past. One more quick question. If and when the vaccine is approved for children, do you anticipate um, it being added to the list of mandatory vaccine kids need to attend school in California? Yeah, I'm gonna wait. Look, on the J&J, &J, we have a Western State Scientific Advisory Committee that's meeting today on the safety and efficacy of the J&J &J vaccine. We anticipate uh, a little over 300,000 vaccines to arrive later this week at the FEMA sites. Uh, we had an ability to order 380,300. Uh, we anticipate a little over 300,000 arrive at the rest of the week. The reason I uh, mention that is to make this point. Uh, we need to look at the safety and efficacy of vaccines as more information is forthcoming uh, from the FDA guidelines come out from the CDC. Our Western States Advisory Group will take a look at the safety and efficacy for those younger cohorts. Uh, we'll be guided by their facts their determination, science, before we make any determinations of mandatory, voluntary, and when indeed those will be made available for people uh, of, of younger age and younger cohorts. Hi, Governor Renee Santos with CBS 13. The question I have is what conversations are happening right now when dealing with teachers, educators who refuse to go back to work simply because there are health risks that they're worried about, concerned about? Yeah, I mean, obviously, we're going to be sensitive to that. And look, no one's compelling anybody. We're creating conditions where we expect in-person instruction. We're going to provide supports, supplementary supports. But people have compromised immune system, people that are not comfortable going back in, be it teachers, uh, be it paraprofessionals, uh, be it classified support staff, uh, be it kids themselves. Uh, for whatever reason conditions. Obviously, we're going to be sensitive to all of those issues. And that's why we're providing in-person grants 
two billion dollars to provide flexibility, and that flexibility is not just ventilation, it's not just PPE, it's not just sanitation, it's also personnel to help address those concerns as well. Second part to that question, Governor, do you anticipate districts then having to look for substitute teachers to fill that void um, until you know numbers progress and teachers start feeling more comfortable in classrooms? Yeah, well, well that's the whole purpose, again, of this agreement, to provide flexibility, provide resources that otherwise didn't exist so those determinations can be made in 1,050 school districts up and down the state of California. Hi, Governor. Alexi Casa from the San Francisco Chronicle. Um, two questions for you, if you don't mind. The first is, uh, what role, if any, have district superintendents and teachers unions played in helping negotiate this deal? Because obviously it will be dependent on them reaching agreements to actually reopen under this framework that you've come up with. And the last couple of frameworks that were proposed by the legislature or your administration were pretty widely panned. And the second is, you know, to your point about the plateauing of vaccine, uh, excuse me, of, of coronavirus cases, you know, the CDC expressed concern today about that as well. So are you looking at delaying any kinds of reopenings or anything like that? given that plateauing in order not to put things like school reopenings at risk? Well, on the second question, we'll be making more announcements on that in the coming days. As it relates to the first uh, point, um, I'm very proud of the work we did together. And, uh, and broadly, uh, it's been embraced. The framework of this agreement has been embraced and has been within the architecture that was originally uh, advanced. And so legislature uh, as well as what we put out. So as it relates to the details, uh, we worked through those details and worked through them in the spirit of collaboration and cooperation with all of these groups, an alphabet soup of groups. Trust me, there are groups and there are groups. We had meeting, conferring back and forth, superintendent, county, local, uh, principals, teachers, uh, people represented, not represented, private, charter, the whole spectrum was part of the agreement, and that's just on our side. I can't imagine what the legislature also incorporated in terms of their own, and then each, each member had their own districts with their own district issues that I'm sure came directly to their doorstep trying to incorporate those issues. So uh, we, we tried our best. Look, there's, there's no other school system like this in the country. It's the largest school system in the United States. Second largest school district itself is just LA uh, alone, which is larger than many states, uh, just that district. Uh, so it's a challenging environment and uh, people navigated, I thought, quite well. And over a course of the last number of weeks, uh, I think we uh, saw the opportunity to be where we are today. So you're saying that you, you do have that buy-in from those large districts and large teachers unions that I'm you sure they'll actually move forward. Yeah, I'm on. sure you'll find some people that will have strong opinions. Look, the bottom line is we created a framework that we believe is consensus. Uh, that in consensus doesn't mean everybody is happy. That's part of the negotiations, part of the process. Uh, you couldn't get consensus in the per in, in days that are perfect uh, with an abundance of everything and no concerns around health risks across any spectrum. So the bottom line is this was done with the spirit of collaboration, bottom up, not top down. And what we presented and what we worked on as legislature really was the collective wisdom of, of all of these superintendents, all these meetings and groups that helped inform our decision making. And frankly, that process began a year ago. It didn't just start a few months ago. We've all uh, iterated throughout this process of understanding and growing in appreciation and empathy as it relates to the dynamics that are constantly unfolding. Hi, Governor. Nicole Nixon with CAP Radio News. I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about how hybrid learning factors into this deal. Um, are you leaving that up for school districts to decide for themselves? Um, asking because surveys have shown that many parents of color are more wary of sending their kids back to school, um, want to see all teachers vaccinated before that happens. Yeah. No, the answer is absolutely. I mean, the whole framework around learning loss, we're just in, it was the pro tem made the point. I mean, we can get in the deep dive in, in terms of the equity framework on LCFF, which by definition is an equity frame, the Title I equity frame, which is part of the First CARES and the Second CARES Act, by definition, an equity frame, the work we did last year on the $5.3 billion on learning loss, which 81% of that was around a deep dive in the equity frame to address the anxieties, uh, 
particularly for some communities as it relates to going back in person, but also providing supports as it relates to the frame of your question on distance learning, hybrid learning, uh, and different models of engagement. And so that's the whole idea here is flexibility, but baseline accountability, much more transparency, much more data collection, much more aggressive framework on enforcement, uh, a new hub uh, that will be provided as schools reopen with information that will be uh, much more navigable, uh, much more available, not just to the media with respect, but to parents most importantly. Uh, and that's the commitment we made to each other and to the letter of the commitment that's represented in the legislation as well. Hi, Governor. Mackenzie Mays with Politico. Um, on the point of teacher union support, would you ever get to the point where you would mandate that schools reopen? Say we get to the next academic year. Is that something you would consider like states, Florida and, and Texas have? Yeah, we want schools to safely reopen, period, full stop. I've been saying this for months. Said this when we announced the original framework in December. I've uh, been saying it even prior to that. So we want schools to safely reopen. We believe they can safely reopen. We believe the data and the science bear that out. We believe what the CDC has been saying. We believe what Dr. Fauci has been saying and President Biden has been saying. We believe that we can do this. And now with additional supports, we have more confidence that we can do it uh, with more granularity, even more safety protocols than we otherwise could have afforded on the basis of uh, not having these additional resources and flexibilities. So we have all the expectations that schools uh, will be safely reopened across the spectrum come this fall. And we certainly look forward to tremendous momentum over the course, not just the next month or two, but notably in the next few weeks. This district's a perfect example of this. They're not waiting till the end of the month. They're starting to move forward much sooner than that. Hi, Governor. Sophia Bolag with the Sacramento Bee. Um, you alluded earlier to the PPP con loan conformity that you and the legislature are working on. Maybe I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> I'm yeah. wondering, in addition to that, are there other aspects of, of early action that you're planning? And also, I'm wondering if you can address why uh, state worker cuts that were implemented last year have not been part of your early action plans with the budget. We're working. We're, and all I can say, and I, I can truly back off now and have the two leaders speak, but we're working on the PPP issues. We're working on sick leave. We're working on a number of other issues and we're working through. That's part of our broader budget conversation. And I can assure you, working with our bargaining units, we're having those conversations very robustly. And can you just address why, um, you know, state those state worker cuts, restoring those weren't part of your early action proposal? Uh, a lot of complexities and I don't want to socialize them right now, particularly because uh, we're working with those bargaining units to address those issues. Is there a possibility that um, those will be restored earlier than just the, the budget in June? We continue to work with the bargaining units. We're going to work with them in a collaborative spirit, great respect and admiration for the bargaining units that really stepped up last year to address a $54.3 billion shortfall. It's not commonly known, and I, I, I love the, th the third follow-up, because it gives me an opportunity to say this, it's not commonly known that state employees took a nine plus percent wage cut last year to help support our most vulnerable Californians to help us close that deficit. I don't know many states can lay claim to that across the spectrum and, uh, and that was very meaningful. Um, my staff took those cuts as well, I did. Uh, and so uh, we're very cognizant of our fiscal health uh, changing radically uh, as now we're enjoying uh, record reserves and we are enjoying uh, a significant surplus, operating surplus this year, mostly one time uh, that we are certainly uh, committed to working with those same bargaining units that stepped up for us last year to address their concerns moving into the future. Hi, Governor. Ashley Zavala with Nexstar Media Group. Um, I'm just following up on John's question about the outbreak data in schools that are currently open. The last time we did get an update from CDPH was for the month of January. I was wondering if you, off the top of your head, might have that number for February. And in that same vein, is there a mandate in this agreement between you and the legislature on, I know you see a bright light, but a contingency plan in the event that COVID-19 becomes widespread again in communities across the state? 
Yeah, I mean, look, no one's ideological about any of this. We're open argument, interested in evidence. We want to see where the epidemiology goes. We want to see what happens with these multiple variants. We have two West Coast variants. We're concerned about the South African variant. We don't have a Brazilian variant yet. We'll see if that happens. Obviously, we're concerned about the UK variant, over 200 cases now reported. No one's, we're all mindful of that. And so that, you know, the future will unfold and we will be very responsive to those changing conditions and those concerns. Anytime you pass a program, we didn't solve a problem. I mean, program passing is not problem solving. You gotta implement, you gotta apply. And in that application, you gotta deal with intended and unintended consequences. So by definition, we're gonna be sensitive uh, to the changing um, uh, realities and, and these mutations. Uh, but at the same time, one needs to be just honest with people and level set. Uh, that we're at down to 2.3% positivity rate. I mean, there's only eight states in the country that have lower positivity rate. Um, that this state is in a very different place than it's been in, in, in a number of months, certainly six, where we were six weeks ago. And as a consequence, uh, where you have no, over 9 million vaccinations now that have been administered, and the prospect, we're going to get 1.58 million this week. We'll get 1.64 next week, J&J &J now being authorized, more vaccines on the horizon, more capacity in our ICUs and hospitals with surge plans that are very, very well oiled in the context of what we just weathered in the last eight weeks, uh, that we are in that phase, that transition phase, where uh, we want to we wanna lean in and we want to step up, get our kids back in school and get our businesses back open safely with modifications, still wear masks, still do all the non-pharmaceutical essentials to mitigate the spread, particularly with those variants out there. But obviously, we'll be mindful. Now, as it relates to the data, as I said, uh, the data, January and November and December is made public in the last month. We've been working with the details of updating this data and those criteria and we'll make sure you see the language specifically as it relates to uh, the expectations on data reporting 24-hour periods, et cetera. Uh, we'll present that to you and, and we'll see where we are. And I'm happy uh, once I have those February numbers to provide those to you as well. But I can assure you, based on the January number, it was lower than the December number, uh, which is interesting because January, we were dealing with the midst of a massive surge. Of course, there may have been underreporting. No one's naive about that. And obviously, that's foundational in this legislation. The speaker and the pro tem demanded that we had higher accountability thresholds, higher reporting expectations, and they were right to demand that. With that, thank you all very much. Wonderful to spend time, and I'm looking forward to a press conference when everybody else gets all the questions. Take care, everybody. For the latest information regarding the COVID-19 pandemic in Cupertino, please visit cupertino.org slash coronavirus.